We weren't able to deliver October baseball, something I feel the fans deserve year in, year out. Um, that feeling of letting our fans down uh, should motivate all of us, every single one of us in this organization. I know it does for me uh, to put the work in necessary uh, to build the next Cubs championship team. I want to thank Joe. I know not everyone uh, in this room was in St. Louis, um, so I want to just take a minute to uh, thank him for everything that he did for this organization and celebrate him um, as the best manager in Cubs history. Really a remarkable five-year run. We could not have asked for more. Um, you know, four trips to the playoffs, three CSs, a world championship, a legacy that'll, that'll live on forever. Um, and I couldn't have asked for a better partner. You know, incredibly loyal and supportive. I learned a ton from him every step of the way, and he changed the franchise forever. So I want to recognize him for the legend that he is and, and wish him uh, all the best. I'm excited to see what, uh, what his future holds on and off the field. Um, quick note, you know, look, when, when we fail uh, to make the playoffs, especially uh, with the second highest payroll in baseball, um, that is not something that is on the manager. Uh, that is not something, uh, especially that is on ownership. Um, when we fail to accomplish any of our, our goals, that is the responsibility, um, that is my responsibility as, as the leader of the baseball operation. Um, so as a leader, it's, it's really important to be accountable, uh, and it's really important to take um, a really honest look um, at things that we can do better, things that I can do better. And um, that's something that we've been doing. Um, it's something that we'll continue to do. Um, be honest with ourselves and, 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 and find areas uh, that we need to improve and then execute and improve in those areas. So um, you are likely to see change in this organization. I think there's, this is a real opportunity when, when you fall short of your goals and, and, and fail to perform at, at the biggest moments as dramatically as we did. It provides a real opportunity if you're willing to be honest with yourself and, and you're willing to take a hard look uh, inside. And um, so there, there'll be an opportunity for change. I think it's going to be, um, you know, we're not blowing anything up per se. That's not the goal, but we're going to, we're likely to see real change, real adjustments at various levels, um, most levels of our baseball operation in some form or another. Obviously, um, the manager, we're going we're gonna to be getting a new manager with our player group. There's going to be some change, um, some real change with our player group. That's inevitable. Um, with our player personnel processes, that's something that uh, we've already started to take a look at and made some structural changes, and we'll continue to do that. Um, with our R&D department, I think they do you know, a fantastic job, and they're, they're innovative and built out. I think we can utilize them a little bit better uh, in certain areas, help them impact uh, major league team and decision making and scouting and player development a little bit more. Uh, scouting and player development, you know, a couple departments that, that we really started to build up eight years ago. Um, and we've been making adjustments as we go to try to modernize, but I think it's, this is a good opportunity to um, take, take a look and how, how would we set it up if we were building it from scratch? How would we set it up not to adjust for the modern game, but to be uh, centered around the modern game? And we've made, uh, already made some, uh, some structural and leadership changes and we'll continue to make, make uh, more adjustments as well. You're likely to see uh, a director of hitting and a director of pitching uh, join the organization um, to ensure that we are um, building these departments, uh, teaching the game, evaluating players for where the game is now and where the game uh, will be going, uh, make sure we continue to be at the cutting edge. So um, there will be some changes. Um, it's our responsibility as, as leadership to take a look at everything that we personally, can, I personally can do better and we can do better as an organization. Uh, because we are extremely energized and, uh, and optimistic about our future. Uh, but it's incumbent on us to build the next Cubs championship team, and that, that uh, continues as soon as this press conference is over. Happy to take all your questions. Theo, is there going to be a change in philosophy on how you make up the roster, meaning more potential athleticism, speed throughout, or at least a little bit more? Um, you know, the goal is to have it all, recognizing that you can never have it all. You have to, you have to make some sacrifices. You know, every, just about every roster in the game is flawed, and you have to you have to try to build a roster that you know has more strengths and weaknesses, and you can mitigate your flaws and overcome your flaws. You know, with, uh, in, in some fashion, something we weren't able to do this year. So, 
look, we want to score as many runs as we can. We want to prevent as many runs as you can. And um, controlling the strike zone is, is, is a huge part of that on both sides of the ball. But yeah, the athleticism uh, is extremely important. It shows up in all phases of the game. And that's, uh, that's an area where, where we certainly can improve. I think the key is, you know, if, if, you, if you try to build a team around athleticism, you often end up um, struggling to win that battle uh, of the strike zone and it ends up, you know, it, it can cost you. So we want to we wanna be more athletic, be more baseball athletic, more baseball smart, um, but continue, continue to build teams that can, um, you know, do a great job of dominating the strike zone and score as many runs and prevent as many runs as possible. So what are the characteristics of the next manager that you would like to run the Chicago Cubs, adding on to all, all the great things that Joe has already brought? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I, I think it's important when I, when I answer any question about what we're looking for in a manager to recognize that Joe is a Hall of Fame manager. Um, his methods work. They, they've worked here for five years. They're proven to work. Um, so please don't take anything I say. Um, as far as what we're looking for at a manager at this moment in time uh, as, as any kind of critique at Joe because it's not. He was the perfect guy uh, for this team at the perfect time. I think everyone who's around the team um, knows that. And um, this is about looking forward. Now for this, the group that we're likely to have at this moment in time and going forward, what are different areas of emphasis that are important uh, for this group at this time? Um, you know, and I, and I don't want to answer too specifically. I know it's a cop out, but if, if I get into uh, a long list of specifics on every managerial candidate that we come in, is this going to list every, every single specific that we said and think they aced the, aced the uh, interview process? So, no, I'll start. I mean, I, look, I think um, we struggled as an organization this year to make sure that with the major league team, the, the whole was as good or better than the sum of the parts. I think we had a lot of good individual performances, we had a lot of um, talent and ability. Um, I think if, if, if we do our job the right way, we're going to have a lot of talent next year. We're going to score a lot of runs. We're going to prevent a lot of runs. We have to, we have to, and the next manager has to create an environment that turns that into wins. And that's, that's not solely on the manager at all. That's roster construction and everything else. But that, that's what we're looking for in a manager is to, is to try to help our group. Any, any team is looking for that in a manager. Um, come together and make sure the whole um, is as good or exceeds as some of the parts. I think you know, the next manager will be a success if he can find a way to get the most out of each player. You know, that's an obvious goal, but um, we want to make sure that, you know, the players that we have, uh, we're reaching them, we're developing them, we're providing an environment where they can continue to grow and, th and thrive. If, if, uh, if, if we have players that are going to be successful major league players, we have to find a way to make it here. Um, I think that's, that's really important. It's an organization-wide challenge, not just on the manager, but yes, the next manager, that's going to be an important um, part of his responsibility. Um, cultivating a winning culture behind the scenes. We've obviously had a winning culture. Joe did an unbelievable job of, of creating that. Again, at this moment in time, you have to, I think it's important for us to pick certain areas of emphasis that, that will reach uh, this group and, and help us meet our, our current challenges, not the challenges that we've had over the last five years. So picking priorities and values to emphasize work I think is going to be really important. Um, I think for this group at this time, um, we need to find a way for to create a, a culture and environment that um, compels every player to push himself to be the absolute best version uh, of himself, to be the, to be the very be absolute best player that he that he can be. And that that is a culture where that's accepted um, or expected rather. That if a player joins our culture, he's lifted up by the culture in terms of. Uh, the, the amount of work, the, um, the habits, um, leaving no stone unturned to be the best, the best version of himself that he can be. Um, you know, I, I think it's important, and Joe, again, was wonderful at this, but it's going to be important for the next manager of this particular group at this time to find a way to, um, to, to foster a team, team identity. Um, that I think this group, there was, our routines tended to be more individualized. There wasn't a lot of work as a team um, and and I think I think it's gonna be important for this group that we can that we find time to work as a team that we find time to assemble as a team that we find ways to deliver messages to the team so that there can be a greater sense of of team identity and, and purpose uh, for this group I think that's something that we need um, you know again at this moment in time with this group I think accountability is important you know we were we were pretty mistake prone this year, this is again organization-wide challenge, not on the manager, but the next manager should be a part of this. Is is uh, helping to create a culture of accountability where um, 
there was just a sense that, you know, uh, sloppy mistakes, mental mistakes aren't tolerated. And so there's an expected level of focus that, that we all work together to, to establish that mitigates the amount of, the amount of mistakes like that, um, that are made. And, and, and a sense of grind, you know, grinding from, from the first pitch of the season through the end. And, um, you know, the last, last couple of Septembers, we've, um, you know, I feel like, and this is, this is, again, it's on me and, and, and on our group, I feel like our team sometimes we expected to just get it done in September and in the second half because we always have. But uh, I think the last two Septembers have proven that you can't, you can't take that approach. You have to find a way to grind from the beginning. It's a challenge. Um, and, and certainly some years we were better at it than others, and it's not something that falls solely on the manager. But that, I think that's a unique challenge for, for the next manager of, of this group going forward. So those are, those are a lot of attributes, and i um, be happy to answer more specific questions about it if you want to. Um, regardless of who the manager is, mm-hmm. do you see the front office taking more of an active role in you know, what goes on the field in terms of you know, lineup, bullpen usage? No. Like no, I don't. I think, you know, I think just about every um, – organization right now is sort of a combination where the the front office uh, tries to uh, collect the talent uh, choose the players assemble the roster and if they're smart they do so with a lot of input from the manager and you ask the manager and the coaching staff to deploy um, those assets and put them in a position to succeed and to win games and and if, if the manager is smart he probably tries to make good use of um, a lot of the the brain power that's in you know the R and D department and the front office and 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 the scouts and everyone available to try to help make good decisions and Joe certainly did that and I think that kind of balance is what you're what you're looking for going forward but we're not looking to be any more hands on at all and especially as far as you know getting out you know, messaging or inspiring the team or that's something that I also the soft factors I definitely want to leave to the next manager to message things the right way. I don't know. I, I, you know, we're uh, we're putting a get, working on our list. Uh, we haven't we haven't called to ask for permission on anybody, but I think we're um, we're f- full speed ahead. We d- we're not going to drag this out any longer than it needs to be. But we also want to be thorough. Um, make sure we. Uh, it's difficult, you know, the interview process. You want to make sure you don't end up with the with the candidate who interviews the best. You want to end up with a candidate who's going to be the the best manager, and that that's that can be. Uh, Nuance. So we're gonna we're gonna do the best we can in that process, but we're certainly not gonna hesitate. Yeah, there was one uh, ex player who sounded mm-hmm. like he was very interested and said so on national TV last night. Can a player who played with some of these guys now be a viable candidate to manage them? Yeah, I mean you're talking about David Ross, so might as well just be honest and answer the question directly. Um, yeah, I think you know D- David Ross is. Um, you know, has has a, a lot of great things going for him. I would say um, his connection to the to the players on this team, and especially his connection to the 2016 team, are not necessarily assets that that uh, distinguish him, or that those are not necessarily things that are going to be important to us. I think uh, Rossi is is a really attractive candidate, and he's going to be evaluated on the merits, what he can bring to the table as a major league manager, um, given his skills. Um, given his experiences, given his worldview, given what he knows about winning, all those things, just as every other managerial candidate um, will be evaluated. But um, I, I, you know, we're looking forward. We're not looking backwards. I think, um, you know, in some ways there's been almost too much emphasis on 2016 and looking back. And so his connection to, to that team or even, you know, to some of our existing players will not be um, – you know, a, a significant part of the evaluation, but it, is it also not a detriment? It's not a, not necessarily a detriment either, as long as um, you know you trust the uh, the person to handle it the right way, and trust the players to handle it the right way. It's something that you have to consider. But I'm just I'm just saying that you know what we're looking for is someone who's who's uh, a great manager for the Cubs moving forward, not not necessarily certainly not looking backwards, and not with. Um, uh, undue emphasis on a couple players there might be personal connections with. That's not a major factor for us. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, he's, he's on our broad list of candidates. I figured I was going to get that question. He addressed it last night on TV. So, yeah, he's one of, one of many candidates. Um, lack of experience is, and I'm speaking broadly for the group, not about Rossi, but lack of experience is, is always a factor. You know, it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a determining factor, but it's a significant factor. I think, you know, I always have greater comfort level, um, 
hiring for, for roles in which the person has done the role before, you know, especially with, with manager. But I think there are ways for that to be overcome. Uh, with, you know, there are a lot of different ways to get experience in this game and, and um, you know, uh, beliefs, uh, skills, uh, personal attributes, those, those can outweigh um, a lack of, of experience, but experience certainly helps. Peter, you mentioned accountability mm-hmm. for quality for manager. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everything I listed as far as what uh, what will help make the next manager a success, or what what it, um, what we're looking for him to accomplish, um, need, needs real contributions from from the entire organization, um, front office included, and player group. And yes, yes, uh, creating a, a winning culture that includes an emphasis on account, on accountability. That it's important to have players who can create that, and we do. Um, I, th- I think, you know, if uh, – and, and it's impossible to, to paint our entire player group with a broad brush, right? I mean, you, can't, you can't say the players were X, Y, or Z and have it apply to all 25 players. We have uh, leaders in that clubhouse. We have players who are accountable. I think if, if you know, if, if you talk to the players and they're honest about um, what, was there enough accountability, just leaving aside the manager and leaving just the 25 guys holding each other accountable for mistakes and um, – Holding, holding each other accountable for um, a certain, uh, certain standards. Um, I'd say it's an area where we can, we can continue to improve. We, I think we can do better. So that needs to come from inside the clubhouse. I think it needs a strong voice from the manager and needs support from the front office as well. Did you say similar last year? Wasn't that part of the offseason conversations with some of the leaders? That yeah, I think a lot of the issues that we have now were um, started to show themselves towards the end of last year. Yeah, always. I think we, we actually um, we, we got good contributions in that area from Daniel Descalso uh, this past year, who had a really difficult year on the field, but was identified by a lot of his teammates as someone who brought um, a real presence, a lot of accountability, and a lot of team building behind the scenes. Um, we'll continue to look to that. We'll continue to look for those attributes and value them in our roster building and player evaluation techniques. Yeah, it is. And how do you explain how things didn't change? I think it just reveals that, um, you know, that that some real change is needed and repaired. I think, you know, a lot of these issues started to come to the fore a little bit, toward, you know, towards the end of last year. And um, we al- we also had a group that's, ac- you know, accomplished great things and um, had made the playoffs four straight years and we won 95 games. And so we were – um, you know, if you want to say we were stubborn with this group, I think I think that's fair. We had real belief in this group, and um, you know, look, I think there's again to be self-critical and, and and honest and accountable. I think there's there can be a bit of a, a winner's trap dynamic sometimes, where when you've had great success and, and won in that group at that time, I think it won more games than anyone else in baseball over those four years. Um, you look when you look back, you look at. Um, the methods and the players and, and everything that had gone on and, and you attribute the success to them rightfully, but it can lead to um, um, maybe uh, attributing um, too many good qualities or ha- placing too much faith in that. And I think it requires um, real leadership to move beyond that. And that's an area where I need to do a better job as a leader, uh, letting go of the past and focusing on, on the future. And this is clearly a moment of transition where I just listed all the you know, different areas where we're going to have change and where we're going to build something anew. Uh, again, I think there are a lot of players from this group, players on the team right now that are going to be part of the next championship Cubs team, but we're going to build build something uh, anew. And I think there were real efforts made um, last offseason, real um, you know, unconventional methods, methods I never want to have to do again, to be honest with you, to try to reach guys. And they, they were coming from the players you know, um, as well. You know, players identified areas of concern, areas where we needed to try to do things differently. Um, and there was good, healthy conversation about that. Um, um, you know, the vast majority of it re- uh, remained confidential behind the scenes. And I think there was good intentions and, and, and good effort. But in, in the end, that kind of change is really difficult, especially with tremendous continuity. And I think that's one of the reasons we're embracing a lot of change now. A couple of questions on assumptions here. Mm-hmm. Uh, assume you're not going to be going over the luxury tax coming next year. Again, it's an assumption. I don't know if that's right or wrong. 
and I assume that there are going to be some either well-known, popular players that are going to be forced to be moved by virtue of salary. No, I think with regards to payroll, I wouldn't make any assumptions because we we are. Um, I think we've come to realize that uh, strategically, it's best just not to talk about it. Um, you know, I don't want to. First of all, there's a lot of unknowns going forward when it comes to what is what is and what is not available to us, say in the trade market, for example. So I can't sit here and speak definitively um, about about what you can expect or what what you can assume. Um, and then it's also, I don't think it's wise to tip your hand to the rest of the industry um, with, um, you know, uh, where your payroll is likely to end up or how you're going to um, treat the competitive balance uh, threshold. Um, that said, I think it's important um, to note, look, we had the second highest payroll in baseball this year. You know, I know some, um, some are, are sort of, pointing fingers of blame at, at, at ownership and, and at Tom. And I, because of that, I think it's important to note, like we've had a top six payroll every year I've been here. We have the second highest in payroll, uh, payroll in baseball this year. We get everything that we need from ownership. We'll continue to get everything we need from ownership. When a significant amount of money opened up uh, in season this year with Ben Zobris' departure, uh, instead of pocketing that money, they allowed us to pour it right back into the team, something they've consistently done uh, with revenues that were then allowed to pour right back into the team. And we signed Craig Kimbrell, which, uh, while it didn't work out for this year, was clearly the best use of those dollars um, to attempt to solve you know, weakness on, 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 a, on a very good team uh, in season. It was a unique opportunity in season, and they allowed us to spend those dollars. Uh, uh, at the trade deadline, um, uh, going over budget again for, for Nick Castellanos, uh, you know, who was, was, was such an impactful player in trying to get us into October, and, and, and everything they've done for, for Wrigley Field on top of the, the, the money they've given us to spend in baseball operations. So I think you could argue that there's not an ownership group in baseball that's um, put more into the team in the ballpark you know, over, over these last years than, than the Ricketts have. So it's not on them. But uh, as far as your assumptions, I think you can assume we're going to have really supportive ownership for the reasons I just outlined. Uh, and, you, and you can assume that we're going to do everything we can to build a sustained winner, including in 2020. You mentioned it's possible comment. that the, the, the offense is like 60 or whatever. You look at the names two through eight, it's pretty darn good Yeah, um, it is. I mean, I think if you go around the diamond, I mean, we had a lot of outstanding individual performances. Um, you know, Contreras had a great year. Caratini had a, had a really good year as well behind the plate. Chris Bryant had a bounce back year. Javi Baez had, you know, another outstanding season. Rizzo had an amazing year. Um, we obviously had some issues at second base. Zoe stabilized us late. Left field, Schwarber had a, had a breakthrough season, especially in the second half, performed at an extremely high level. J.A. had a, um, you know, a, a, a productive year. And then right field, Castellanos, I know it's just the last third of the season, but was, um, was a revelation in the right field. So you're right, should that add up to um, more than the fifth most runs? Um, in the league, yeah, you know, on paper it should, but it, it didn't. And I think in the past it's been easy to look at, you know, our performance with runners in scoring position and, and high leverage offensive performance. That was actually better this year um, in, in, in a lot of areas. You know, we're, we're certainly losing the, the contact battle. You know, we make, make the least contact out of anyone in baseball. And um, I think despite those great offensive individual seasons, I think we're still um, – you know, we're still a team that can be game planned for, and, and we see the fewest fastballs in baseball, and, and that's that's an adjustment that you'd like to think we'd, we'd have made by now, but we haven't, so we have to own that and, and continue to try to, to, to improve in that area. And then the base running, you know, uh, by far the most outs on the bases in all baseball, that cuts into it too, why some of the components don't add up to, um, you know, being among the top two or three in run scored. I mean, we were, we were third in uh, – uh, we had the third lowest ERA in the league, you know, the fifth, the fifth most run scored. So in a lot of ways, our pitching outperformed our hitting. You know, a lot of the, the emphasis on the pitching, and certainly if we get into the pitching, our high leverage pitching um, certainly was not satisfactory. Is the answer to the Brian guys that they just did better? Or you get a little bit more complete 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think the more well-rounded hitters that you have, the better. I think, yeah, I think it's continued growth from certain certain players and um, focus on their their areas of weakness. And then, you know, we've made some transactions. Castellanos was one, looking you know for guys who cover parts of the strike zone we're otherwise vulnerable to, and finding some hitters who are a little bit harder to game plan for. As far as the player development goes, too, um, have you guys come up with any uh, discussion as far as um, bringing players up too early? Um, I think, you know, we're, con we're constantly evaluating that. It's, it's, it's all based on the individual, you know, um, Nico Horner is a good example. We don't ever draw it up that a player is going to skip triple a, and it's not determined yet where Nico is going to start next season. But, um, given his mental makeup, given his skill set, um, who he is as a person, we felt that was something under the, cir under the extraordinary circumstances that he could handle, um, I think it's important that player development continues at the major league level. You know, these days it's, it's becoming a younger player's game. If you look around baseball, young, you know, the best teams have young players dominating. Um, yes, it's not linear. There's going to be regression at the major league level, but our, um, you know, our players have had some real regression. It's taken a while for them to dig out from. Um, so that's something that we have to solve. But I think the answer is, you know, sure, pushing forward with player development finding ways to really finish finish development off as best you can in the minor leagues, but understanding, too, that you need to create a, a real um, an environment at the major league level where players uh, who are expected to perform night in and night out are still developing and um, you know, still working on their weaknesses, still um, making adjustments um, to the league, and that's an area I think we need to do better. That said, do you think, do you think you might have to take philosophy on the type of coach that is at the major league level rather than I mean, no, I, I don't want to blame anything on coaching staff. I mean, we've tried a variety of coaches, as you know, you know, over the last couple of years, and they've all had their own skill sets and um, ways to reach the players. So, I mean, we'll continue to try to build the, the single best coaching staff that we can, and there's, there's a lot of talent in that coaching room. Um, um, I just think, you know, I think we need to, we need to go in um, – with the expectation that the player's development's not finished, because it's not going to be. You know, young players do not get fully developed in the minor league. So, yeah, finding coaches that can um, that can reach young players and win at the same time is a challenge. But you know, we have a lot of good coaches here, and we'll continue to try to build the best staff possible. Hey, yo, speaking of uh, young development, how mm -hmm. disappointing has it been that you haven't been able to develop your own young pitchers, and how much is it that an emphasis going? Yeah, that's been you know probably the biggest. Um, shortcoming in the, in the organization overall um, over the last eight years. Um, it's something that we need to address. I mean, to put it into context um, or to offer a brief counterpoint, although, you know, it doesn't, doesn't mitigate the impact of this at all. You know, our goal has always been to find good major league pitching. We want to pitch well at the major league level. And part of our broader strategy when we got here was to um, – build through young position players, uh, acquire, acquire uh, young position player, amateur talent, develop it, and develop a core of those position players that could thrive at the major league level, and then build a great pitching infrastructure that would, and, and, um, that would be able to uh, take major league pitching that we acquire through trades or through free agency or through other means and, and, um, and win with that pitching. It was the overall strategy. I'm not saying we weren't trying to develop pitching. We have been, but that was, that was the broader strategy. And in our five-year window where we've been competitive, so from 2015 on, we have the second lowest ERA in all of baseball. You know, the 30 teams, we have the second best ERA. So we've had, we've accomplished that part of the goal. We've had really good major league pitching, but there is a cost to pay when you don't develop your own pitching. It's certainly uh, um, been a disappointment, and it's put us in a position to have to be overly aggressive um, in trades and free agency to maintain that level of having elite starting pitching. So we've we've had good pitching. Uh, for that to continue, we need to start developing our own, and we've made a lot of adjustments. Um, 
uh, the last couple of years. You start, you saw some of the impact of that you know, in the major league bullpen this year with uh, some players coming through our system, some players acquired in really small trades that we had some specific development ideas about and our development staff and our R&D guys did a great job using old techniques and cutting edge technology to help these players make adjustments and, and thrive and in some cases dominate at the major league level. We need a lot more of that. Um, I think you're going to see a, a you guys all right? Oh. Hope that's not an omen. Um, you're, you're, as I said, you're going to see some some restructuring in the pitching department where we attempt to um, keep the impact guys we have, put them in position to succeed, and also bring in some some outside voices or some new voices to make sure we're at the cutting edge. Do you expect Craig Kimbrell to need any medical procedures such as like Darvish and Morrow had last year to have to clean up of some sort? No, we don't expect him to, to require any surgery at all. We um, He's... Really determined to have you know a great off season and, and looking forward to a, a full um, and legitimate spring training. Um, you know he feels feels awful about the way this year went. Um, Recognize that he was in an unusual position, but uh, I think you're going to see a really determined individual next year will benefit from the full spring training. Following up on Bruce's question mm -hmm. about Bryant and Baez, are they going to be surgery free this off season? Uh, yeah. That's our belief right now. And we have a, a full medical meeting coming up in about a week, so if anything changes, I'll let you know. I don't, think we don't, I don't believe we have any, um, any surgery scheduled. Yeah. So going back to the offense side, mm -hmm. how do you plan on addressing the leadoff spot this, this winter? Um, well, you know, that's, that's an area where we can clearly do a lot better. I mean, those are, those are um, unacceptable numbers that we got out of leadoff this year. So I think, I think – um, there are a couple of different ways to go. If we can acquire a prototypical leadoff hitter, that'd be fantastic and and uh, make everybody's life easier going forward. If we can't, you know, the best solution is just is get as many players who get on base as possible and have a lot of different options of guys that you can throw up based on matchup situations into that spot. But um, you know, I think I think we have to do we have to do a better job of having m more diverse offensive skill sets so that you know, including players who specialize in, in uh, getting on base and if they can be a great base runner all the better and set the table for the guys behind them but that's I mean that's the lowest possible hanging fruit that there is if you look at our, our leadoff performance this year that has to get better and it will. Yeah, as you're thinking that evolved and just the sense that I mean, literally everyone that went up there mm -hmm. Kind of like the ninth inning for a leader, no, well, Riz, Riz did well, so not yeah, everybody, right, right, but right. yeah, no, there, yeah, there were guys, there were certainly guys who it affected their performance throughout the course of the year. No, I've always, I've always felt that if you could get, you know, one guy to hold down the position, um, that was a huge asset for a team, but that, um, you know, if you have to do that at the expense of having, you know, a hitter who's just who drives the ball, knocks and runs, and is you know gets on base and slugs, and therefore you're not comfortable putting them in the leadoff spot. It's not worth it. You have to um, find as many as many outstanding offensive players as possible. And the teams I've, as a rule, the teams I've built have always placed a huge priority at getting on base, and and so we've we've always had or usually had lots of options. You know, if you have if you set out as a goal to lead the league in on base percentage, you're usually not going to be. Um, wanting in the leadoff spot. So I'd rather keep that goal as just, you know, one through eight, find guys who get on base and it should take care of itself. But the best outcome by far is to get someone who's comfortable in that spot, thrives on that spot, in that spot, provides energy and sort of takes the onus off everybody else. But that's always been the case. We just haven't always been able to, to do that. You talked about Joe Madden being all of managers, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if we find the, the the right the right person, he's not going to be concerned about filling Joe's shoes or living up to expectations on, a, on an individual basis. He's going to be uh, focused on um, uh, making this the best organization, the best major league team it can be, uh, having sustained success at the big league level, maximizing each year's chances. So for next year, the 2020 Cut, Cubs chances get to October and then play good October baseball. So I think there's, you know, what I've seen managers when they when they take over when they join a new organization there's so much going on there's 25 relationships to build 
just on the 25 man roster, you got probably another, you know, 30, 40 relationships of players who are going to impact the big league team in one way or another. You've got your entire coaching staff, the entire front office, ownership, media, fans. You have to uh, develop systems for run production, run prevention, communication, how things are going to work. Like it's, it's drinking from a fire hose. And so I don't think there's going to be much, much thought about, um, you know, having to fill Joe's footsteps, except I think the right, the right manager will ask a lot of questions about what Joe did to make him so successful and uh, what's not broken that doesn't need fixing. And then what areas there are where he can make his own mark and where we can move the ball forward. Is there Loretta in place? Yeah. We, you know, our coaching staff, we're going to meet with them tomorrow. So I don't want to get into, specifics but i'll say yeah we do as 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 we've um started to assemble our original list here um there, there's at least one member of the current coaching staff that we'd have interest in talking to as a candidate anybody else in house I really yeah I, again i haven't talked to i haven't talked i don't i did I, I mentioned rossi specifically i haven't talked to our coaching staff yet so i'll i'll, I'll uh get back to you late tomorrow i want to talk to those guys face to face first <laughs> Um, you know, we have a lot of good players, and and we have high standards, and 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 we absolutely want to win the World Series next year, and we want to uh, keep making the play, you know, the playoffs as often as possible. You know, four out of four years felt a lot better than four out of five. Whenever you don't make it, it's horrible around here, and it's not something that we want to we want to experience again. Um, so, um, you know, next year is a priority. We have to balance it with the future, and probably uh, that's more important now uh, th than it was even a year ago because we're we're now um, just two years away from a lot of our best players reaching uh, their end of their period of club control with the Cubs. So I think I think the goal is to um, do everything we can to win the World Series next year. We also have to pay attention to. Um, the long term and maximize this window while also putting in a lot of good work to open a new one as well. So um, we, you know, there are a lot of examples of teams that go right up to the very end of a, of a contention window with their players and then all of a sudden face, you know, a, a, a long term painful rebuild. And, and that's not something we're interested in. We don't want to put our fans through through that type of long process. So um, the art of it will be to, to do everything we can to ma maximize all the talented players that we have now and also um, make sure we're in a really good position for the long term. I know we're always, uh, we're always told there's no, there's no such thing as an untouchable player. Mm -hmm. But even a year ago, you know, there were big headline rumors on KB. Is, is he in play? I mean, are we to the point where everybody even at his level is in play? Yeah, I'm not going to address anything with specific players other than to say yeah, I, I don't believe in untouchables and never have. I just think um, they're obviously players who are really hard to move and um, you're just doing the organization a disservice if you close it. It's hard enough to engage in trade discussions. Why would you want to create a subset of players that you can't even talk about? So it's um, that's just something we won't do. And yeah, I think, look, we're open to change. I mean, we're open-minded about this roster and, and – um, you know, I, I expect to have a lot of trade discussions this winter. Again, I think I think a lot of the players on this year's team are going to be part of the next Cubs championship team, so we want to be mindful of that. But it's also really hard to accomplish um, improvement and change in certain areas it, 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 unless you're extremely open-minded. And um, you know, as we have in previous off seasons, we've also you know I, I think we'll, we'll we're very likely to engage certain players in discussions about long-term contracts and uh, see if there's a way to extend players' windows as Cubs that way. And, and if that's not possible, that might, that might make you, um, as I said, open-minded about trade. So there's, there's more, than, more than one way to sort of take full advantage of, of a player's value. Um, and we're just going to you know, balance those concerns going forward. Yeah, you know, complacency is a it's a tough word. And again, if I say if I say there were instances of complacency, then it, it's it's too easy to to paint everyone with a broad brush. And I wouldn't do that because I respect our players and and their work ethic. I, but to, you know, to be honest, and, and and I'm getting a lot of this also from our players who you know they're 
you know, they're open with us about things that, that we as a group can, can do differently. I think there was just, as I said earlier about the, you know, the winner's trap of looking backwards that applies not just to us in the front office, but also to the players group. There's, there's a lot of looking back at things that have worked in the past. There's a lot of looking back at 2016. There's a lot of reliance on our natural ability and the fact that this is how we do things and we've always come through in the past and a certain mindset, a certain elan that we have here that, um, you know, if you look at the last couple of Septembers, you, you, you can make a strong argument that that doesn't work anymore. And so we have to, um, we have to try to create a winning culture for now, you know, not, not what was a winning culture a few years ago. And I think, I think that we were intent on doing better in that area. All of our players are, they all want to be part of something that's, 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 uh, the best culture in baseball. That should be the standard. You know, there, I, I look at, you know, a couple of organizations in particular with envy the way I'm sure they look at our organization in a lot of areas with envy, but, um, we want to we want to have a culture where when a player steps in here midseason, he's not providing energy. There's already energy, and when a player steps in here midseason, uh, he's uplifted by the culture. Where now he looks around and says, "Wow, every single one of these players is getting the absolute mount most out of his ability. He's putting in um, incredible hours and making sacrifices and great decisions to be the best version of himself as a player." Now that's what I'm expected to do as a Cub, and that just uplifts everybody and. We're going to continue to strive to get there. Theo, has any team come to you for permission to talk to Jason or Jed? Or was they automatically no. going to be here? Uh, no team has contacted us. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have an example of going back to that? Go ahead. If you don't mind Sorry. going back to the pitching for just a second, mm -hmm. where do you evaluate in the now the starting staff and sort of what's in front of you when it comes to that group? Yeah, you know, I think. Um, we had really high hopes for, for our starting group this year. I think, you know, as you looked at it, one through five, we felt we had a chance to roll out, you know, a, a really quality starter on a nightly basis, and that might be an area that was a separator for us versus some of the teams we were competing with. Um, while we had a couple guys have really good years and while all our starters had their moments, um, it didn't prove to be a separator. You know, there was in injury and some regression, especially after injury, uh, led us to be closer to the pack, uh, certainly than we had envisioned. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's um, an accomplished and experienced group, but with the experience means that, you know, we, we could stand for some, to add some, some younger talent and refresh the group as well. We certainly need to add depth. And we need to add, uh, um, you know, some some youth and a little bit of a different look to the staff as well as we look forward. Well, give me an example of um, what you meant by modernize and also what exactly the director of pitching you, you hit him is it an organizational thing, major league level thing? Yeah, modernize. Um, again, yeah, for example, like, yeah, you know, like our, you know, our, um, our our pitch lab is a good example. You know, it's something that's behind the scenes and. You know, we've, um, despite what I described earlier as a tendency to look backwards and being 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 self-critical, we have been innovating. We have been pushing the envelope. Um, I think part of the winner's trap is, is it's sometimes harder to implement that stuff because the existing methods have proven successful, right? So if you come in somewhere new, somewhere fresh, you can implement everything that you want and it's a challenge of leadership and it's an area where I need to do a better job as a leader of even though we've been successful in certain areas um, executing that type of change so we've we've been um, working for for many years now on with the most cutting-edge technology to develop the, you know the ability to um, have great pitch design um, pitch tunneling pitch sequencing uh, velocity building programs and certain areas we've been really successful other areas uh, we haven't been and we need to continue to do better but um, I think the the goal of someone in the role of director of pitching is to um, have real clarity on what our pitching philosophy is what our separators are going to be as an organization how we make the best use of the most cutting-edge technology uh, for the state of modern pitching and most importantly where pitching is going over the next several years and then uh, implement that from top to bottom of the organization, um, more on the on the minor league side, but with a working relationship with the major league staff, so that we um, have you know the best possible methods with how we how we teach pitching, how we maximize our pitching, and how we evaluate pitching. Ideally, would it, would it be your your best players uh, who are the most responsible within the clubhouse for 
embody the things you're talking about, accountability, connectedness, all that. Are they uh, sufficient in, the, in those areas? Uh, Baez, Bryant, Contreras? Yeah, we, yeah we, have a, we, we have a lot of leaders in there. I think we can all we can all do better as an organization, as individual players they can. You know, I think, uh, you know, if you want to take Anthony as an example, because I think he is our leader, um, this is someone capable of heroic acts. And I don't use that um, word lightly, but when you see what his ankle looked like that night and he was able to come back from maybe a six-week injury in three days, that to me that showed real courage and tremendous leadership. Um, and... Uh, based on a lot of conversations we, we had with him last winter, he was um, more mindful this year of uh, being a proactive leader uh, in every sense of the word. And so being more, th more thoughtful about the impact of every action and every word because there's great emphasis, a lot of eyes on him in that clubhouse. And I think he made real strides. And he'll be the, the first to say, and this is something he was saying, is, you know, I need to find a way to be better. I need to take that to the ne to the next level because when you f when you fall short as a team and when there were sort of obvious areas of um, you know where we can improve as a team this year it was just a tough year as far as you know the the focus we had on the field at times and our ability to rise to the occasion and play well in big games I think if you're any kind of a leader you ask what you can do better and so that that's what someone like like Riz is asking but we need to. We need we need to all be accountable for that, and we need to supplement it with with help from outside too. Yeah, it was a it was a you know real um, interesting year in the pen where you know it was. Our inability to pitch in high leverage situations was a clear problem and was a contributing factor in all the, I think we had the third worst record in all of baseball behind just the Tigers and Orioles and combined one and two run games. Um, and, and our inability to pitch in high leverage moments, you know, kind of haunted us throughout the year. And that's something that I have to do a better job of, of, of finding options for. Um, this is, so it might make, you know, it led a lot of people to paint the whole bullpen with a broad brush. And like we, we were actually, I think, um, Fourth, fourth in the league in bullpen ERA, second in the second half, um, which doesn't mean anything if you can't pitch in high leverage situations. But I think it shows the talent level that that's there and 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 encouraging as well because a lot of those contributions came from some under the radar uh, pitchers, guys who are you know up through the organization or acquired in small deals who I think made real important adjustments and and showed that they can they can. Uh, compete and potentially dominate at the big league level. So we just need more of that. We need, um, you know, we need, we need to keep unearthing pitchers who, um, um, you know, we acquire for the right reasons. We, we work well with and, and have the, the physical and mental uh, wherewithal to go out and, and, you know, miss a lot of bats, which is something we didn't do a lot of, although we did increasingly in the second half with, with the, this pitching group and uh, find more guys who can, you can go out and pitch in, in high leverage spots, certainly. What's your comfort level with uh, Wilson Contreras' defense when he's not catching John Lester? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, he's extremely talented, uh, extremely talented catcher. Um, probably the, uh, as good a thrower as anyone in baseball, as good a blocker as anyone in baseball. Um, spent a lot of time uh, working on his framing this year. You probably noticed he tried a lot of different techniques. I think, I think it was a... Uh, an important year for him because I think he, he he tried some new things. He figured out what works for him and what doesn't, whereas you, you know, not everyone can attempt framing the same way. And I think uh, towards the end he found something that um, that he believes in, that he's going to continue to work on this winter, and you're going to see see a significantly improved framer and, and, and receiver going into next year. But, um, look, we've had a lot of success. Um, we've won a lot of games with Wilson Contreras behind the plate. We've had a lot of success pitching with Wilson Contreras behind the plate. There are certainly areas you can continue to improve upon, but if, you know, shame on us if, 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 if we can't uh, continue his development at the big league level, because this is like the most tooled out athletic catcher who has a huge heart and cares and want, and wants his pitcher to succeed as well. So, um, yeah, Wilson, um, I know we lost a lot back there when he went down with injury. And, um, you know, the best version of Wilson Contreras is 
an MVP candidate, difference-making catcher who also makes your pitching staff better. So that's what we're continuing to work towards. Steve, you mentioned that you hope to be active in the trade market. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of good individual performances. How do you kind of weigh this is a guy that broke through and you got to keep him, or this is a guy you got to take advantage of maxing? Yeah, just try to do a good job evaluating your own talent. And it's not mutually exclusive either. You know, I think there sometimes there are deals made where it's, it's, it's more important what you're getting back than what, than what you're giving up, especially if you're dealing from a position with, you know, where you have some, some quantity. Um, but, you know, it's not – it. again, I think the focus will be on what we're bringing in and, um, and, and what a player's value is to us, not only for next year but over the long haul when, when assessing the trade market. But certainly it's key when, you know, when players make, make improvements, if you can uh, – if, if you're um, – in tune with the work that goes on enough behind the scenes to, to try to have an informed opinion about whether it's real and sustainable or whether it's, um, you know, more of an illusion. I think, you know, with the majority of our guys, this has been a really, this has been a year where there's been, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of targeted work and improving in, in certain areas, handling certain pitches in certain parts of the strike zone, going back to the minor leagues to work on a certain approach. And, 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 and a lot of that work has been really fruitful, and you saw the results um, towards the end of the season with a number of our players. You know, because of the success that you've had mm -hmm. and the culture that you know, has been created since you hired Joe the last time you were looking for a manager, has the importance of a manager changed or lessened um, in, since the last time you were looking for one? No, I think I think the manager is a crucially important role. I mean, if, um, take Joe for example. You brought him up. I I still think he doesn't get enough credit for um, changing the whole identity of the team in 2015, creating a mindset that allowed these young players to operate with you know without anxiety and with a lot of bravado and 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 go out there and be themselves and perform at the highest level including in the postseason when you, know, you talk to a lot of players who've played a lot of postseason games that's not easy to do there's a lot of pressure you guys carry a big burden on them in the postseason you can sometimes see that in their play and you didn't see that with our young guys and i really really attribute that to joe and and his mindset and his sensibility and the environment that he's able to create for for young players so that's no less important now um if if anything you know if you look at the particular challenges that we have now with a group that has one and sometimes can be caught looking backwards a little bit too much and um trust their methods and the comfort of their past successes and the comfort of of their routines and things that have worked for them very well in the past it can be important to have a manager especially a new one has this kind of opportunity because um he hasn't been around to push that player to the next level, to let go of what's come before, embrace the challenges of taking their game to another level. Um, so that's that's a critically important role. I would never I would never um, underestimate the importance of a manager. It's not really reflected in the, in the pay scale though, in the, that around baseball. I mean, the manager making less less than that. Well, it was for us. I mean, we 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 have no problem, you know, paying the right manager an appropriate level and if that's an experienced manager who's one and there's a lot of competition for his services well you know we always pay according i can tell you because i know this there was this uh, uh this was implied in one of the articles the, the uh joe's contract the the, the amount of money that it, it will, will be paying for a manager has never come up one time literally never come up one time that you know we should consider a change so we can pay a manager less it just has not uh, been bantied about in these walls, period. So. How, how ready for you or, uh, are you for the reality that how it, it goes from here, specifically how the next manager does and is perceived, will really reflect on you know, your decision to split with a, a guy you describe as a Hall of Famer and a legend and all that? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm up for everything that comes with this role. I'm up for high expectations. I'm, I want what's best for the Chicago Cubs, and that means sometimes you have to make tough decisions. And if, if you ever make decisions based on, you know, the perception or having to go through some tough times personally because of it or, or because you fear that um, the ramifications of something that comes next is not as good as what you had before, then you're just doing a disservice to the Cubs and you shouldn't be in this role. So, uh, you know, how – how ready am I for that? I'm I'm ready to build the next Cubs championship team. I think that's what our what our fans deserve, and that me, that means in some areas some some really hard decisions, and it means embracing the future and and um, you know moving on from the past. Steve, when it comes to 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, easier easier in the American League or National League is definitely easier in the American League. I mean, the National League has this unique challenges, but is the amount of information. I think if you if if um, if a manager is able to set up a system, put a system in place where there's there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes, and he gets the the information that he wants in the way he wants it, in a way that allows him to. Um, Op operate efficiently and effectively and, and, and see the big picture in the course of a game, then, then you know, all the information helps make his job easier. If you try to do too much or if you don't delegate the right way, you can become paralyzed by all these different data streams coming at you, and that's self-defeating. So I think um, you know, re relying on methods that have worked before, talking to other managers about how they streamline things and delegating to your staff is really important for any manager. I know it's uh, naive to think that the next George Springer is waiting out there for the Cubs, but how would uh, how, how would you look at uh, upgrading center field? And uh, you know, if you could find somebody that actually could fill both roles, how how, how much further do you think it would take what you already have that's really good in place? Yeah, I mean, center field and second base were were the two positions where uh, you know we had the least production this year. We had the most trouble sort. Of, um, Finding consistent performance, so uh, we do have we do have in-house options. But you know, being transparent, of course, it's an area where you look to upgrade and see if you can get the the total package with the prototypical center fielder who can also lead off. If you look at the landscape of, of center fielders in the game, it's not exactly a position with you know uh, great surplus or an overabundance of, of of options out there. So. Uh, you just have to be realistic. You know, if you if you spend um, all your time waiting for that next guy who solves all your problems to be there, you might pass on some good options where you could put things together with a platoon or use use a player that you currently have and complement them with a with a more uh, attainable player from outside the organization. But yeah, it's a really important position, especially with you know um, the makeup of our roster, the makeup of our team, center field, and as we talked about earlier, lead off those areas where we have to focus. Are there guys? Um, it might turn out that way. I mean, there might. Uh, that depends how the the team that's uh, in the playoffs will want to handle things. So, but, so, so you do have to on our broad team. list. Yeah. yeah, there's the broad list includes at least one person whose team's in the playoffs. How much of a priority will uh, resigning Nick Castellanos be? Uh, man, I I love everything about Nick Castellanos. I mean, what what a job he did. Um, Coming, I don't think you can ask more of a in-season trade acquisition than what he did. Is the production, uh, the consistency, the you know uh, dynamic uh, at bats that he had, um, and then the way he went about it, just with uh, a lot of passion, a lot of professionalism, a lot of hard work, um, team-oriented approach, and um, really became invested in the Cubs and, and, and his teammates in a short period of time. So. Um, Love the way he plays the game, and um, would love to have him back. It's obviously, you know, a more complicated <laughs> issue than just would you love to have the guy back. So um, he, uh, you know, he's worked long and hard to get to free agency. He had an unbelievable year, especially his time with the Cubs, and he deserves the right to take that into the free agent market. And um, he knows that we'd love to have him back, but he also knows that it's uh, not as simple as that. So, so, yeah, so I feel. Sorry, Sully. Uh, I'm you, uh, I mean, you praised Joe. You guys ended mm -hmm. on good notes and everything. But I still, other than this blanket statement that Joe's just good, I really haven't heard why it had to happen. Because Joe is the perfect manager at the perfect moment in time for us, um, for the group that we had, and um, where they were in their careers, what they were trying to accomplish in the game. Um, the identity that we needed to establish. He was the perfect guy. And if I could go back and do it again, I obviously, anyone in this room would, would go and hire Joe Madden again. And now we need the perfect guy for this moment in time, uh, for this group, for where they are in their careers, for um, the way uh, their skills and their habits and their outlook have evolved. It's, there's a unique challenge at this moment in time that um, we, we feel like, you know, 
if I were in a different situation, I would hire Joe in a second. I would hire Joe in a second today. Um, but for this group, you know, by definition, I feel like change is important. So there are just certain things that a new voice can accomplish that the same voice, no matter how talented, even a Hall of Fame manager can't quite accomplish the same, uh, the same, especially with our group. So, you know, I, just as an example, I talked openly about, and I'm guilty of this, and I think many in the organization are of, you know, looking back at the success we've had and um, thinking to yourself, well, that's how you know, that worked in the past. So um, if you need to do things differently, sometimes it helps to have a new voice that, that can disassociate from what's happened in the past. And um, yeah, I, think, I think we can all benefit from turning the page and looking, looking forward and not backwards. And Joe was... Joe is going to go somewhere else and dominate. He's going to change the culture. He's going to get the players to um, um, relax, be themselves, get the absolute most out of their ability, come, t come together as a team, establish a new identity. Um, there's going to be an Elan established in that organization that's going to carry them forward for, you know, to a lot of great successes in many years, wherever he may end up. Um, that's not necessarily – that, that's not to say that if we brought back Joe in 2020, he would accomplish those same things here with this group because it'll, it would be his sixth year and it would be a different moment in time for our group. So that's the best I can explain it for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's valid. I think, I think, um, you know, the, on the, on the spectrum of, um, making things really hard on your players intentionally so you can sort of battle test them and bring out the, the grit and determination and force them to, to grow up and come to battle every day and sort of fight for their livelihoods uh, versus on the other end of the spectrum, um, providing them every possible resource they could have to be the best version of themselves. There's no doubt that, we have uh, been at one extreme. We've, we've given these guys everything they could pass, possibly want, you know, the best clubhouse in baseball, tremendous support staff, tremendous resources, tremendous support from ownership. And um, I do think that's the way to do it. The, the, uh, I would definitely rather be on this side of the spectrum than the other. But it's important to be able to um, do that while keeping players hungry and keep keeping keeping. Um, players honest and hungry and 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 pushing themselves to be the very best that they can be and I think there's a lot of that in our clubhouse yeah I'm not I'm not painting with a broad brush but I'm just being honest with you that and in talking to all of our players too and we just finished exit interviews I think we we all we all feel that um you know we could put a little bit more emphasis on uh work especially working together uh as a team on on pushing limits to be the very best version of themselves and getting away from some of the routines that have proven successful individually because there's another level that we can all get to. Did I answer your question? Do you have a follow-up? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you want us to blow up the clubhouse? Uh, no, 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 it's not that. Because I do think guys in their care. Mm -hmm. um, no, I meant the creature comforts you oh, referred well, to. Well, some of them maybe. <laughs> <laughs> But the idea of, uh, like, continuing to, to, you know, stoke the hunger, I mean, that's got to come from somewhere. And whether that's uh, a guy in 2016 goes AWOL and, and you, you stick the, uh, stick the uh, uh, team psychologist on him and you, and you look at him. All I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, it's like, we talk about accountability. And, and yeah. there's plenty of I can just tell I can just tell you this. Our, our players um, – are being directly challenged to be the absolute best that they can be. And they know that there are consequences for not doing so. And you saw some of those consequences play out this year. Now, should the front office be the one um, sort of in charge of that type of motivation on a day-to-day -day basis, or even with some of the things that happened last off season? I thought then, and I think now, no, it should not. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, 
we need to create a culture in the clubhouse with guys in uniform that they push themselves to be the very best version of themselves. And some of that has to come from the manager and the coaches and fellow players and teammates. And that's, that's what we're trying – the co overall culture. We have a great culture, and I think we're going to try to take it to the next level. And we're also going to tell them that Gordon Whitmire wants them to rub some dirt on it and <laughs> get after it. <laughs> Don't be the umpire. You are. Yeah. No, we have we have an open mind. I think you know you always learn a lot when you have an opportunity to do a managerial search. It's it's you know, manager of the Cubs is such a such an esteemed position. You should have access to just about anyone in the industry you want to talk to, and um, you know through through the through the managerial interview process, you you I think you learn a lot about what you're looking for too because the the right candidates can can open your open your eyes to things you never even thought of in the first place that said i think we have a pretty good feel for what we're looking for and what lies ahead for this group this moment in time just as in you know at this time in 2014 we felt it was worth going through taking some really difficult and uncomfortable steps to get joe because we had something in mind you know the, the, we f we f we feel like there is somebody out there who can who can really help our group get to the next level. It's going to be a challenge, but you have to go in open minded. Follow up on that. When, when do you mm -hmm. start interviews, and is this at all in the public process that Gordon? Yeah. Or yeah. No, I think um, I've done it both ways. I I I, I don't you know public and, and confidential. I think. You know, as public as it needs to be, I think is the best answer. Like, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to roll guys out here for press conferences and everything. It's something that we did, I think, for the first time, you know, 15 years ago. Um, I don't necessarily want to do that, but um, we'll, we'll try to make sure it's a smooth process and you guys can, can follow along at an appropriate distance. <laughs> Yeah, I said it's an important factor, but not a determining factor. It's not a prerequisite. I don't know, probably sometime next week. Just taking uh, Gordon's question a step further, you, it took so long for you guys to establish that this was the place to come, and you did such a good job of it. Do you think you, you guys might have gone too far making it too comfortable and too great here that you know the uh, appreciation is not there any longer? It's kind of the same question. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say this. I think I think it's it's our job to communicate, and we have that. It's a privilege to to play here and and to be a Chicago Cub and to go out and perform for these fans. And there's a lot of trust and responsibility that comes with it. And and if there's not performance, that privilege goes away. I mean, that's 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 sort of the the, the bottom line. And I think we've we've uh, in certain instances, done a good job of that. In other instances, we probably haven't communicated it effectively enough or in time. So, um, that that's that's really important. But I I, I don't think um, it, there shouldn't be a dichotomy between providing resources and instilling hunger. I think both both those things can be accomplished in in the kind of organization I want to be part of. Did you take a hard uh, look at everything? Do you, did, did you miss some opportunities? Do you think to aggressively try to move some young pieces, you know, young players of significance, of, of significance and, and should you have started that process uh, sooner? Yes and no. I think overall we've been pretty aggressive. I mean, if you look at look across Major League Baseball, this, there can, the industry is kind of accused of, you know, hugging, hugging their prospects at times and holding on, holding on to players and caring a lot about prospect rankings and things like that, not being willing to make deals that might make you look bad. Uh, even if you get the performance you're looking for, you're afraid of what you're going to give up is going to burn you. I don't think we can be accused of that. I think we've been really aggressive moving a lot of our young players. Now, I think there are times that we've done it really artfully, um, and there are times that we've done it in a really clumsy fashion or just been dead wrong on guys. And, and um, you know, if you're being honest with yourself, that's, that's certainly the case. There are times that we've given up too much in deals and, and more importantly, not gotten back what we were looking for. Um, there, there have certainly been deals that we've really hit on as well. So, but I, no, I don't think I don't think overall we haven't been aggressive enough. You know, looking trying to supplement this group and add to it. We've been really aggressive in season. If you look at the last two 
in-season moves, you know, Castellanos this year, Hamels and Chavez last year. I mean, I think those were those were well done. Some of the off-season deals, um, you know, we we haven't hit on, and uh, we just need to do a better job. We just need to be right, not not more or less aggressive. We just need to we need to get get these right. <laughs> You're taking this hard. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to address the David Ross thing because he's part of the organization, and you know it was sort of already he already addressed it publicly. But um, as far as other candidates, um, we'll we'll let you guys know again in due time. Um, my biggest self criticism. Uh, I mean, I think I think. Broadly, it's been um, sort of have it, looking back and at, at this group that we won with, and, and I had this belief that this group of players who won the World Series at 22 and 23 years old, many of them, um, were going to grow into an unstoppable um, set of players if we could if we could continue to supplement them and show faith in them and. Um, because it's pretty, we were the youngest team in World Series history, I think, or the youngest team to win a World Series. If you look at the starting players, and um, you know that that hasn't happened. And I've I've uh, made decisions to pour a lot of resources, you know, every available dollar, you know, that we've we've poured back into plugging holes in this group, trying to find pitching for this group, trying to elevate this group. Uh, a lot of prospects to your question. We've traded out a lot of young players who were blocked by members of this group. We've traded out out of belief in this group, and um, you know I think it, it, you know to that broad theme of like of a winner's trap and and putting you know having too much correlation to methods and players and things that have helped you win in the past. I think I think I can be guilty of that. If I could do it do it over again, I'd try to as a leader try to find a way to be more objective and more critical and. Um, more open-minded to various different ways to do it. I think that's got us in trouble if you look at the amount of resources that have gone out the door trying to supplement this group. And then the other one is just, you know, this is, uh, you know, you, you gotta you gotta hit on deals. I mean, if you look at if you look at a five-year rebuild was just about perfect. You know, it was probably one of the best in history, if not the best. And why? It wasn't because it was like grand strategy or any new, you know, new new paradigm of how to run a baseball operation is because we performed at an extraordinarily high level. We hit on an incredible amount of deals and got impact players back where, you know, in deals where we shouldn't have. And, and, um, and we haven't performed at that level since then. So, you know, that's, a, that's an easy area of self-criticism too. And so you question, you know, you ask it, what are we doing differently? Um, adjust our approaches a little bit and, um, but stay, stay aggressive and know that, you know, um, we're the right group to build the next Cubs championship team. Can you back on that a little bit? You've mm -hmm. always been honest about personal self-reflection. Mm -hmm. From last year sitting up here saying you got to fix an offense that's broken, mm -hmm. what have you learned as to this year doing it any different? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think we were in a little tougher spot last year, again, not to make an excuse, but we, we had a number of – we didn't have really good individual seasons last year, so that we didn't have the amount of players with maybe value in the marketplace to go out and make a variety of changes. We just didn't. So we really focused on uh, internal solutions, environmental changes, um, you know, changing the hitting codes, changing different points of emphasis, um, helping players continue along their development paths. And this year, I, I think, you know, just being honest, there are more options open to us. You know, we have a lot of players who have tremendous value to us and in the industry because they're studs and they've gone out and put up really good numbers. And so um, I just think you have to be aggressive for what you want. You know, if you if you want – and some of that's anticipating what the environment's going to be, like what ball we're going to be playing with and, and everything else and trying to figure out what, what you're trying to build. Um, but then be aggressive for what you want. You know, it's 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 really hard to teach contact. Um, you know, we had a ton of raw power. Raw power ended up being not as important given given the environment that we were playing in this year with the ball and everything else. And contact became extremely important. So, I think we have to be aggressive towards what we want and hold ourselves to a really high standard. Darren, you 
mentioned a couple of times how working together as a group instead of individually, how would that or could that manifest on the field in terms of production and, and wins and losses and all that? Um, it just does. I think, I think teams that have real great sense of identity and sense of purpose and understanding of common message and common goals, you know, when you really get it right, being connected and part of something bigger than yourself, I think that uplifts everybody and that allows the whole to be greater than the sum of the parts. But I think, you know, more specifically, I, I do think we, this was a common theme from our players. Like we, we do have, every player has a routine here and there's just, we're, we have really individualized routines. So guys aren't together doing their work. We don't take ground balls together as a team. You know, we, we took more batting practice this year, but less than, than, than most teams together. And I think <clears throat> being open to having the group work together more, and this is something I heard from players too, allows them to develop more connection, allows them to get a better feel. Like so your second baseman, a new second baseman can, can take a throw from a third baseman before it's in the game. So you can see what kind of tails on his throw. And then you don't, you don't, see that for the first time in a game for as an example and then beyond that there's just the the intangibles of working together and you're out there grinding away and develop a greater sense of connection and and being open to uh you know assembling more as a team and 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 it's not college baseball we don't need it to be college baseball where everyone's together all the time but it's being op open to assembling as a team and hearing a message and talking things i thought we did an awesome job of that in spring training um a little bit less so during the year, kind of got away from us. But um, you know, it's not not saying like meetings are gonna gonna solve everything. It's just it's, it it uh, Joe had an awesome way of getting his message across without you know he had the meetings a few times throughout the year. He had his own way of doing things. But I think just being open minded that if if the group can develop a real sense of team and sense of identity through working together and through meeting together, something we can be open minded to. That's not a that's not a critique of the way things have gone in the past. It's just a potential area. To do things differently, try to try to accomplish something different. You just mentioned something about knowing what ball is going to be used in the field. Mm -hmm. if it, if, I would assume like rule changes as well. Don't you need to know that? Yeah. November first. Uh, the yeah, the sooner the better. Is that for batting minimum guys? Well, yeah, we'll see. I think there's a plan for that, but you know things have been known to change, so we'll see. You know, I think at this point everyone's expecting the 26 man rosters and the three batter minimum, but we'll wait to get definitive word and. Yeah, we'll 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 see. I I actually cut one open on my desk to try to start the process. So I'll sh I'll show you a picture. That's a, that's a lot of yarn. Holy moly. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I look at both those guys as um you know, incredible players who are huge parts of what we have going on here. And they happen to both have two years of control left. So, um, you know, they're both guys we've, we've, you know, had some level of discussion with in the past about trying to find an arrangement that can keep them Cubs longer. And we'll, we'll probably, you know, get around to doing that again this winter, uh, you know, at some point. And, um, you know, we'd love, love them to be Cubs, but again, they're, they're, all these players, these are guys we have to be open-minded about too. Trying, trying to keep for the long term. Do you just keep them for two years, or do you contemplate listening on on trades for them? So I look at them both the same. That they're they're fantastic players. I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think they're both hugely important. And and um, you know, it'd be hard to see them out of a Cubs uniform. But we're at a transition point, and we have to do whatever is best for the Cubs. I hope it includes both those guys. So is reckoning the wrong word to assign to what's going on? Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to use really boring language on purpose just so I didn't get anything thrown back at me for a year. And it, it also tried, tried to be less verbose. That's hard for me. Um, but no, reckoning, I, Sully asked me this the other day. I mean, honestly, a reckoning is, it's, it's, it's an accounting, it's an evaluation, it's an appraisal of, of where you are. And for better or for worse, and ultimately as a team, it was for worse at the most important time of year, we showed ourselves where we are. And so had we gone out and played great baseball and, and played up to our potential or the hole was much better than the sum of the parts and we, um, you know, we're most importantly, we're still playing and went deep in the playoffs, I think there'd be more of a tendency to, to maintain or to at least look 
with, with an open mind at the status quo, but because of this accounting of where we are and what we did this year, it's, I think, really clear to anyone who's paying attention and to us that we have to build something anew. Now, there's a good chance it's going to include a lot of a lot of the same players. I'm not saying we're going to get rid of anyone. I would never threaten anyone. I would, you know, I take their careers really seriously. I feel in part like responsible for their careers and for them achieving their goals. And um, and I care about these guys. But the, the reality is we are building something anew. We have to be at, at every level of the organization. And that includes asking and answering the hard questions, includes a lot of self-reflection, and it includes some change. And, and I laid out several areas where we're going to have change, including probably the player group. But it doesn't mean we're going to take it lightly. It doesn't mean it's going to be extreme. Words don't mean anything. Actions do. And we don't know what's available to us or what's not or what we're able to pull off or what we're not or what not. And I can't tell you what decisions we're going to make or not make. I can just tell you we're really intent on building the next Cubs championship team. And if, if, if this year made our evaluation clear for us and helped us stop looking backwards and start looking forwards, then, then in that sense, a reckoning was worthwhile. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Broke the record? No. Uh, my goal was to be shorter. 121. <laughs> the count, the counting. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That's why Julian's here, right?